Hello and welcome back to the second part in this series of videos about the USB Mega Drive dev kit. Uh, so I recommend you watch this full screen in at least 1080p. Uh, Alright, so today I'm going to show you how to use the GNU Debugger GDB with the UMD cart to hack commercial game Sonic 1. So let's get Sonic 1 started. Um, so as you can see, as before, I've got the, uh, the, the UMD cart plugged in, um, but this time I've got the, uh, the USB cable connected. Uh, connected back to my PC. So let's start this game running. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to do is get a local copy of this uh, of this um, game that's running, the code, because uh, I want to manipulate it later. Uh, so I can do that with this loader command. Uh, so that's read the entire contents of, uh, of, of the ROM. In incidentally, it's read it whilst the game is running, so the, 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 the RAM here is, is dual ported, so um, Accesses by the PC doesn't, don't interfere with accesses by the Mega Drive. Um, okay, so I've got that. Um, so the next thing I can do is start this GDB bridge. So the GDB bridge actually forms a, a bridge between GDB itself and the, and the Mega Drive. Um, uh, so I'm now going to start the uh, the debugger actually actually running. I'm going to use the DDD D, uh, the DDD front end to GDB, which is a nice front end. You can use other front ends like the Eclipse IDE if you want. I quite like DDD. Okay, so you'll notice that when the debugger starts running, the first thing it does is it completely halts the machine. All of the the animation effects on on uh, on the screen have stopped. The music has stopped. It's just replaced by this continuous tone. And on the uh, on, in the debugger window, you can see all of these instructions that were about to be executed. Um, so I can do various things. I can I can step through this code. I can uh, examine memory, alter memory. Uh, I can set a breakpoint here, and I can click continue. So right there, the the code has um, it's executed a, a few instructions. Let's go back to B10 where it started. Um, so it, it's executed this instruction, then you know, all, all, all of these in, in turn, at, at full speed, in, in, in real time. Um, and in, in addition to that, it's also saved a trace log. Uh, so let's have a look and see what the trace log is. Um, so there's this, there's this trace log. Uh, the trace log is, is a binary file, and it basically keeps a, a track of every single bus cycle that is executed um, whilst executing these, these few instructions. So it's a binary file. So let's. Uh, I've got this little program called LogRead, which will give us a, a human readable um, rendition of it. So the first column here is a timestamp. Now there's a uh, there's a little counter uh, inside the the, uh, the FPGA, which increments every 20 nanoseconds or so. So that just gives the the current value of that counter. So it gives us a 20 nanosecond resolution uh, view of each of these each of these transactions. Uh, so the second column is an indication of whether it's a CPU access or a DMA access. The third column is whether it's a read or a write. Uh, the fourth column is the address that was accessed. Uh, the fifth column is the data that, that was read or the, the uh, data that will be written to that address. Um, and finally, if the access is inside the cartridge address space, which this isn't, um, then this will print the the word that is actually at that address, uh, at this address in the cartridge. And ordinarily, of course, these two will agree. Uh, but um, if I make modifications to the cartridge ROM, then obviously these will differ. Uh, and LogRead will print a little star at the end here, just so that we can see it happening. So right now, the execution is is within the uh, the, the monitor program, which is loaded uh, at 400,000 on startup. Um, so. If I scroll down here, hopefully we'll be able to see the actual code that we've told it to execute. So there it is. It started off at B10, um, and the, in the first instruction is a 4-byte instruction. It goes from 10 to 14, um, so it requires two words read from, read from memory. Uh, it then starts reading the next instruction, B14, um, and because the 68000 is, is, a, is a pipelined architecture, you don't actually see the evidence of the first instruction executing until after that. Uh, so there it is, there's all of the uh, um, 68000 registers being written down to the stack. And then it continues B16, B18, and so on, the code continues, until it hits this, 4A, 4AFC. Um, 
Now, 4AFC is, is just the 68,000 illegal instruction vector, uh, sorry, illegal instruction opcode. So ordinarily, when this particular game encounters a 4AFC, it, it will jump to uh, a handler routine, um, which will basically just print uh, illegal instruction on the screen and then just stop. It's completely useless. But then the game never, never expects to encounter an illegal instruction uh, that, uh, uh, when it's normally running. Um, so what I've done, so or ordinarily what the machine does is it encounters the illegal instruction uh, opcode, it jumps to the, uh, to the Ill illegal instruction vector, which is located in the first 256 bytes of the ROM, um, and then it, hand it jumps to the handler there. So I've actually replaced the handler address, which ordinar ordinarily in Sonic 1 is just this 03E6, which is the code that just prints illegal instruction on the screen. But I've replaced that with this address 400,000, which is the monitor address. So contr control subsequently just returns to the monitor, and the monitor carries on carries on running, and we get control control back. Um, so uh, what else is there? Let's uh, let's delete the um, let's delete that uh, breakpoint because it will interfere with what I want to show you next. Um, so, I guess the, the other thing is, in addition to this trace log, um, it has also saved a RAM dump, so a dump of the entire 64K of, uh, of onboard RAM, both before the code executes um, and after the code finishes executing. Um, so this is quite useful because it allows you to compare these two snapshots and see how the global state has been altered by the execution of these instructions. So. Let's see if we can uh, use these two features to uh, to give Sonic infinite lives. Uh, so first I, I'm going to continue execution of this and get him into harm's way. So that's getting, getting him pretty close. I can just hit escape and get control back. Um, so let's do that again. So this time I'm, I'm going to continue and I'm going to get him killed. So at the moment you can see he's got three lives here. Um, so what we're going to do is continue getting killed, uh, and then we can compare the before and after dumps that we get, uh, and see see if we can find the address where this uh, this life count is is stored. It's a reasonable supposition that it's going to be stored at, stored somewhere in the 64k of onboard RAM. Um, okay, so I'm going to click continue. I'm going to get him killed by this little bug, and then I'm going to hit escape again. Um, Okay, so so now as as before, we've got these two um, these two RAM before and RAM afters, and we've also got this Sonic uh, uh, also got this trace log. And you'll notice that because the trace log before was only executing a handful of instructions, it was quite small. But this trace log is quite big. Um, it grows at about at a rate of about ten megabytes per second. So yeah, you could um, if you had like a two terabyte drive, you could you could trace all day. Uh, and it wouldn't fill up. Okay, so the the next thing to do we've we've got this little we've got this little hack dump program, um, and what that does is it will compare the 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 dump before and the dump after. Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of extraneous differences between these two. The di the the changes that we're specifically interested in are, are cases where the number three has been replaced by the number two, and it's found a candidate here, uh, FE12. Um, so uh, actually, the um, uh, the um, the sixty-eight thousand uh, uh, sorry the 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 sixty-four k of onboard RAM is is mapped uh, at the very top of the of the sixty-eight thousand uh, twenty-four meg address space. So this FE twelve actually corresponds to a physical address of FFFE twelve. Um, so now we can just search for that in the in the trace log. So there's the there's the trace log. We can just search for that particular um, that particular uh, address uh, in the in the trace. So right now we're searching through the trace log for occurrences of um, of writes to that FFFE12 address, and it takes quite a while because it's quite a big it's quite a big file. Um, so uh, even though I got him killed only like one one second or so after after we started tracing. Um, one second is ten megabytes of data. So, uh, okay. So there's there's the first um, write. So um, 
as expected, it's writing a two there, so it's it's replacing the number three with the number two, um, and uh, we can we can scroll up here to see what 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 it was doing previously. Uh, so unfortunately, there's no way to distinguish between instruction fetch cycles uh, uh, and operand fetch fetches and data reads and writes, but you can usually tell the instruction operand sequence by the fact that the address increments. Uh, so it's basically looks like it increments, it, it seems to do a jump here, uh, uh, 13864, and then it seems to jump to 1387E, um, and then from there it, it seems to just be a continuously incrementing set of, uh, set of addresses. Um, so, okay, let's, um, let's have a look to see what the code looks like at that address. Uh, so there it is, 1387E, and it's da 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 down, does all this stuff. And then here is the candidate. So here it's, sub it's subtracting 1 from FFFE12, uh, and if it's not equal to 0, then it will jump to this address. Uh, so in order to give him infinite life, the, what, we, what we basically need to do is always jump to this address. So don't, sub don't decrement this count at all, just always jump to this jump to this address. And the opcode for that happens to be 60632. Uh, um, and we'll be replacing a, a four a four byte instruction. This this instruction here takes up four bytes of memory. Um, because we will be replacing a four byte instruction with a two byte instruction we'll we'll pad it with a, a knop just just so that the dis disassembly window doesn't get screwed up. Uh, so the NOP opcode is 4E71. Uh, okay, so let's do that patch. So, so I've set um, I've set the the, the contents of uh, the the 32-bit word at this address with with this with this data. So the first thing is the is the 6032, which is the branch always to uh, to this uh, to this address, and then the second thing is the is the not just to pad it. So this hasn't updated yet, so it still says sub subtract fe12 branch if not equal. Um, so if I refresh that disassembly window, um, you can see that uh, the uh, where is it? Oh, B B10. Sorry, um, I jumped back to the wrong wrong address. Uh, so there it is. So uh, it's it's been replaced with a branch always to that to that address. Um, Okay, so let's continue and see and see what happens. Okay, so at the moment Sonic has two lives, um, but if I get him killed again... This time the life count hasn't de decremented, it's still two. Let's do it again. Okay, so it's obvious that that's worked. The, the counter, the counter just doesn't doesn't get doesn't get decremented. Um, okay, so that shows you some of the UMDK debug capabilities when running a commercial game. Um, if you're interested in doing your own homebrew development uh, for demos and games and stuff, have a look at the next video, which will demonstrate the source level debugging of the menu program, which you saw right at the beginning, um, which is written in C, um, and that means that we can interact with the debugger at a much higher level. Okay, thank you.